Welcome to the show, Stephen. Thanks for having me, guys. Good to be with you. Yeah, we're so excited to dig into your latest book on peak performance. And as we get started here, I'd love to learn what piqued your interest in peak performance and, and how you started researching and developing out the book. This book is uh, it goes back all the way to the beginning of my career. To, and, and I started out as a journalist covering uh, both science, neuroscience and, and psychology and the topics that, I, that I've read, written about for years uh, and action sports. And action sports in the, in the 90s was this era of impossible, right? More impossible feats were being done than ever before. We'd never seen anything like it. And, you know, there's a quote from Jeremy Jones in Art Impossible where he says, you know, it, it was literally like stuff that was impossible in the morning was possible by evening. And the rules were like rules that had been set up since the beginning of action sports, like don't ever do this or you'll die. We're changing on an hourly basis. And that caught my attention, right? Just demands an explanation. Um, and, and more so one, first of all, these were friends of mine, right? These were like, so it's, it's one thing when people are doing impossible things and you see it from a distance. It's another thing when you're like drinking with the dude in a bar on Monday night and on Tuesday, they do something that's never been done in the history of the world. And, but more importantly, the athletes I knew in this world, very few of them had much education. They didn't have any money. They came uh, from very difficult backgrounds, a lot of them. This is a group, and there were lots of drugs. There was lots of wildness. This was a group of people that if you were to like draw them out on paper and say, what are the chances of like, you know, living through the year, let alone redefining what's possible for our species, it, you wouldn't bet on them is my point. And I want to know how is this possible? How is this possible for this group of people? And then that question led into every other domain, how I went from, action sports right into a list of 30 different sci-fi technologies, sci-fi ideas. And I was in the room when most of them, you know, became science fact. And I, how did that happen? This is impossible stuff. You dreamed up the future, right? You, this was a blind man and something he can see, right? The world's art of first artificial vision implant gets turned on, which is technically a biblical miracle, right? It's not even impossible. It's a right. biblical miracle. And and it's, it started out after looking at this in dozens and dozens and dozens of domains and tens of thousands of people and really working on the neuroscience along the way, there are commonalities, a lot of commonalities. And really smart people have been on your show to talk about focus or mindfulness or gratitude or flow or different pieces of the puzzle. But what has happened now is we've, the science has gotten far enough that we see the whole picture. Like, oh my God, it's one whole system. It's designed to work together in a specific order in a very specific way and anybody can use it. And if you actually start working with it this way, you know, the moral of the story, I think after 30 years of looking at this, long answer to your very short question that I just abused the shit out of, um, <laughs> is uh, if there's one, if I sum up what I learned over 30 years, it's that we are all hardwired for the extraordinary. That's the evidence over and over and over again. Nobody I met started out as an extraordinary person. They just didn't. And I've met more people who have t done the accomplished the impossible than probably anybody else alive. And none of them started out extraordinary. They all became extraordinary by following actually very similar processes. So that's the sort of the big, the big lesson. But it started with action sports. It started, um, and I've had the pleasure today of just being on the phone with a handful of people from my past. So it's been really fun. And we were talking about what it looked like back before we knew what was possible. Now we are sort of like, oh yeah, we've seen people jump 300 feet on a snowboard, but there was a period of time in 1994 where the best in the world would tell you that no human body can survive more than 70 feet off a cliff. You can't do it. And that was right. And now we're over 300. So, you know, it's that kind of stuff. I want to bring you back a bit to the action sports thing because I am 47 and I grew up skateboarding and I grew up skateboarding during the 90s when it had an explosion along with all the other action sports. And that wave, there was also something else that you missed in there and I'm sure we'll get to this. There was a self-expression that was involved in that, that that we have not seen before and it come out in sports where these folks have taken this passion uh, of, of And also in the 90s, we had enough technology where we could look back and see the beginnings of skateboards and surfboards and their humble beginnings and pushing them forward 
to be able to do what they did. So we had a hand in advancing this idea. And while we were advancing it for all the boomers that were around us, our parents were like, oh, I remember skateboards. Like, you don't remember them the way we are going to remember them. And making them something that was extraordinary. And by tapping into that, that very thing of taking something like a skateboard and making it extraordinary translated it to every other area in my life. And I think that is something that separates Gen X from their, from our parents, but also is able to now, now we see it in technology. We see it in Instagram. We see it in Twitter where people are now taking these humble seeds of these ideas and blowing them up to extraordinary expression. And so in reading your book, I had picked that up and I was really looking forward to this conversation today to, to venture into some of these evidence. You, there's two points here that are there. They're, so I'm going to mention them both and then we're going to, we'll go into both, but they're both excellent. They go in different directions. Um, one thing that you talked about is, you know, I always sort of, casually introduce myself as an old school punk rocker and it's yeah. funny because most people hear that and they think oh punk rock anarchy they don't and i'm like no 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 yeah. this yeah. was diy this was self-expression do it yourself My like yes. right so that it's a totally different thing and there was you know there was an anarchy wave but there was also a, a different wave but the more important point is the bulk of my work is on the science of flow, right? The state, the optimal state of consciousness and flow states have triggers. And this was the biggest, you nailed the biggest deal about the action sport athletes in the 90s. Creativity, pattern recognition, the linking of ideas together is a very powerful flow trigger, right? It releases a little bit of dopamine. Dopamine drives focus. You drive focus enough into the present moment, you have flow. And that was the big deal in action sports. What happened in the 90s, is one, they started living in such a way, action sports communities started developing, right? So you essentially got action sports skunk works. And skunk works in general are built around foundational flow trigger principles. And you, so you had that in the communities, but the value shifted and that was the big deal. Up to that moment in time, fastest man or woman to the bottom won. And suddenly it was most creative line to the bottom, most creative way to interface with the wave, most creative way to interface with the sidewalk. That was what made you a winner. And it massively spiraled up the amount of flow, which essentially turbo boosted everything. And that to me, everything. and we talk about that in the book, right? I always think about the action sport athletes. They made creativity their core value. It was the center of 100%. everything, right? They, they believed and, it was also a fairly unique form of creativity. I've come to realize, meaning when you talk to older, younger generations now, we were our generation was very distrustful of fame, of celebrity, of power, yes. of commerce, of of a lot of stuff like that. And so, I like I have to educate my staff these days, people who are a lot younger than me. I'm like, just because they're famous doesn't mean they're right. Right. Like there's a there's a big difference here. Nobody in my generation would ever assume that you're right because you're famous or powerful or rich. You would most likely distrust you. And then you'd have to earn that trust if you came out of that world. I want to bring back this this icon for all extreme sports. And this is leads into where you said where this creativity got hit and then it blew up into sort of a fame and a power and and its own self-destruction and i think you well, can you're, link you're, that you're, you're, to you're the talking first... about tony alva in other words well no i'm going before that i'm going with evil can evil so he had taken motorcycle and was the first action sports hero and and to and bring tony alva into this they had taken that same spirit as children watching Evil Knievel on motorbikes, and they took that same attitude and creativity to the sports that they had around them, surfing and skateboarding. It was that same energy and excitement that surrounded Evil Knievel that they wanted for themselves as young people, and they found it in the toys around them. You're totally right, and emphasis on your point, I was part of 
you know, there were hotbeds for action sports. Squaw Valley was oh, yeah. one of them. And I was part of the Tahoe community in the 90s. And there was another community in Jackson Hole. In Jackson Hole, they were mountain men. They were very serious. And they were amazing, badass athletes who pioneered all of Alaska. But the Squaw Valley, the Tahoe contingent, led by Shane McConkey, influenced by Evil Knievel, the whole point was make be do the most badass thing in the world and make fun of yourself along the way. Right. Yeah. It was sort of the that was that evil can evil spirit. We saw a lot of people in costumes, right? The same kind of costumes he was wearing. Squaw Valley community, they called it podium gear, right? Everybody had to have their evil can evil like costume when you won the X Games or whatever in the early days. So there was a direct carryover from that lineage. You're totally right. Well, I want to touch on this idea of flow state and the connectedness of this community because you know, I remember watching documentaries now around this exact time period where skaters would see one skater pull off a trick and immediately it would pop in their mind another way that they could tweak that to make it their own. But no one had thought of this before. So how does this flow state in a community work? Because we've heard about flow state on a personal level, but how does it all interconnect? You're asking a very cutting edge. The answer is we don't know. The, the, the truthful answer, I'm going to fumble around here for a little bit because I talk a lot and it's a fun question, <laughs> but like the real answer is we don't have a fucking clue, but um, flow is very, very involved in all kind of all aspects of community bonding, right? Most kind of, if you think about things that bond communities are really like blue collar level concerts, football games, those all, these are experiences of communitas that's group flow at scale. Right. So you can have individual flow, me in a flow state. You could have group flow. It could be interpersonal flow, me and you. We're one on one talking. Or it could be the three of us, group flow. There's team flow, which is a slightly different thing. We're not going to go there. And then you can go up and scale the communitas, which is when you get it at a, at a cultural level. And obviously, experiences of communitas and, you know, the, the people were writing about flow and the power and community. So the earliest in, in sort of the Western canon that we find flow is Nietzsche. And the term was originally great. It's Goethe who coined it. Rausch was the German term for flow, but it was to describe like Dionysian cultural, everybody got drunk. It was like early Oktoberfest, right? Or Burning Man meets Oktoberfest. And they needed a term to describe that. And they came up with Rausch, this overflowing of flowing joy that sweeps up right, the crowd, and um, it was a core part of kind of Nietzsche's philosophy in, in terms of self-improvement and things along those lines, and it just carried forward. It, the problem with the cutting edge of flow research is on this stuff. The problem is it's hard enough to try to measure flow in an individual, but trying to measure flow in a, in a, in a group at once, like we're, our technology just isn't there yet, but it's getting there, and, um, and we're getting closer. You know what, my a flow research collective, my organization is working on a biophysical-based flow detector. So something that can measure uh, neurological signals and physiological signals and tell are you in flow or not. And hopefully what you can do to get deeper into flow or to get into flow if you're not. We think we're three to five years away from that. And we're not the only group working on it, right? Like, in fact, a couple of guys on my board are actually even competing against us. They have a different version of the same kind of thing. And to me, it's the more the merrier. I just want to solve the puzzle. So I don't, I don't really care who solves it. Let's just solve the puzzle. But group flow is sort of on the way. And there's a couple of groups who are have been really looking hard at, at, can you precipitate group flow? Can you use technology? And they're starting to ask questions about measuring it. And I don't know how far along they are. I haven't talked to those guys in about six months. Well, I... I know that I've experienced it myself strapped on a snowboard. Very elusive quality for me outside of that. Don't consider myself creative, more analytical. And we haven't really talked as much about flow on, on this show in particular because it's certainly not our expertise. But I would love to at least unpack on the individual level what the science shows and, and how our audience who maybe isn't in an action sport can work to start to tap into a flow state. We started there. And I, look, I'll, I'll, I'll gab about action sports all day long because I've got a background <laughs> yeah. there. But the point really is that flow is actually fairly common in action sports, but it shows up. People spend on average 5% of their work life in flow, often without even realizing it. The big telling detail for people, what sort of unlocks the mystery is flow is a spectrum experience. It's like any emotion, anger. You can be a little irked, you can be homicidally murderous, it's the same emotion, different ends of a spectrum. So flow is psychologically defined by there are six core 
characteristics, phenomenological, how does the state make you feel characteristics and complete concentration in the present moment, uh, time dilation, which means time passes strangely, it speeds up or slows down. You'll get a uh, diminishment of self-consciousness, self-awareness and, and awareness of certain non-critical bodily functions. In other words, you don't notice you have to go to the bathroom when you're in flow, right? Um, there's a sense of control. There's a heightened sense of pleasure and enjoyment, what's known as an autotelic experience, meaning an end in itself. It means once an experience produces flow, we go really far out of our way to get more of it. So when those experiences are showed up, when all six are present, we call that experience flow. They could be, sh they could all show up and be dialed down to like one or two. And this is experience we've all had. You sit down to write a quickie email. You get sucked in and you look up an hour later, you've written an essay and maybe your sense of self didn't vanish, but you had to go to the bathroom and you just sit, you're like, oh God, I gotta, I gotta take a pee, right? And you had no idea time was passing. That happens to all of us all the time. That's a micro flow state. The opposite end of the spectrum is what you're talking about, which is much more common in action sports, among other things, is a macro flow state. Macro flow is such a peculiar, powerful, weird experience that we thought it was a, we meaning the scientific community, thought it was a mystical experience until like the 1940s or 50s. It was a psychologist, Abraham Maslow, who found flow is kind of a core trait among a group of extremely high achievers he was studying, not just successful people, but people who had really great moral lives and were had a lot of meaning and purpose in their life. That's he didn't mean high achievement the way we we do. Um and Scott Barry Kaufman is is on my staff. And when I misdefine anything with Maslow, he yells at me. And so <laughs> I don't want to get my Maslow wrong because I'm tired of getting yelled at. Um <laughs> but uh yeah so it, macro flow is you know it's often described as a full low mystical experience. And we now you know and we could talk about this obviously moving forward, but we understand the out of body experiences happen in flow, for example, sometimes in you know, deep flow states. We now know why. We know what in the brain is causing that. We know all why does self go away? Why does time pass strangely? All these really so called mystical qualities, we now understand the neurobiology of. That doesn't make them any less emotionally powerful. You know what I mean? They're not any right. less mystical just because we understand where they come from. And I always say, People on one side of the argument, they they love the fact that there's biology underneath so-called spiritual experience. I'm like, look, this proves nothing. It doesn't like if there's a God, it means God talks to us through biology. If there's not a God, then it means the biology works. And for some reason, these kinds of experiences are useful for us. It's one or the other, but it doesn't settle the discussion, the argument right. at all. So I'm not taking a position on on a theological position one way or the other on this. And this myth of the 10% of our brain in use. We, we hear it all the time. It's such a commonly used term. Can you help us debunk that? Yeah, so, obviously... so the debunking is really funny because it's a William James, the founding of founding father of psychology. He made the statement and then Andrew Carnegie in Think and Grow Rich or Dale Carnegie in Think and Grow Rich misinterpreted what James wrote. Thus, we get the 10% brain myth, which is the idea that we're only using a small portion of our brain at any one time. So peak performance, aka flow, especially must be the full brain on overdrive. And it turns out, as you're smiling about it, we had it exactly backwards, right? In flow, in our state of peak performance, we're not using more of the brain, we're actually using less of the brain. The technical term is uh, hypofrontality. Hypo is the opposite of means of hyper. It means to deactivate, to shut down. And frontality refers to the prefrontal cortex, part of the brain that's right back here. Um, we used to think five, six years ago that it was the whole portion of the brain that deactivated. Now we believe it's a more localized deactivation depending on what you're doing at the time. But needless to say, why does time pass so strangely in flow, right? Why does time slow down and get a freeze frame effect? Or why does it speed up? Well, because time is this network that's processed by a bunch of different structures and prefrontal cortex. And like any network, the nodes start to shut down, the whole thing collapses, we lose the ability to separate past from present from future. Now, it turns out that has enormous performance benefits for everybody, not just for action sport athletes. The simple thing here is anxiety, as we all know, is an enormous break on performance, right? It's the, one of the main destroyers of performance is anxiety and fear. And most of our fears, are either scary shit that happened in the past we'd like to avoid from the present, or it's horrible stuff that might maybe just, you know, could happen in the future and we want to steer around. 
So if I remove past and future as options in your brain, you're plunged into what you know psychologists talk about as the deep now um, or the elongated now sometimes, or, or you hear poetically the eternal present, right? Either way, it means that our time processing is all screwed up. But as a result, because all this anxiety plummets, stress hormones get flushed out of our system, right? As we move into flow, you see, you see all the stress hormones get lower down in our system. Same thing happens to our sense of self. Self is another construction. It's the prefrontal cortex working with deeper parts of the brain. But when the prefrontal cortex goes down, you lose your ability to create your sense of self. What's the bonus here? Your inner critic, that nagging always on to feed his voice in your head, right? For the older folks in the crowd, your inner Woody Allen, right? <laughs> Woody goes silent in flow, right? And that's that's a right. big deal. As a result, risk-taking goes way up. Creativity goes way up. Innovation goes way up. Often productivity goes way up, right? Because you're no longer yeah. doubting every idea you have. You're no longer second-guessing yourself. So all these things are massively increased. We're literally neurobiologically getting out of our own way, which I love. So, Stephen, one of the, the things that I was thinking about with this, and even in speaking about it in, the, in this conversation, it brings, it brings me to this point. Are we doing damage to our young children by not sticking them outside and telling them to go busy themselves rather than being in front of a screen? Well, like being outside, using that imagination starts to open up pathways that will help children learn how to get in flow and feel flow. Where if they're having this technology, they're not using these aspects there's these parts of the brain they're actually hindering the development of the brain in in those areas and from the research that i've been seeing it seems to me that those parts of the brain are not developing and that makes me worried <laughs> about the future i always tell people i have expert knowledge around flow and learning and flow and education i have zero knowledge around children I try very hard to stay in my lane. I don't have children. Yeah, I, I don't really like children. I don't like <laughs> your children. I Sometimes I don't like people who have children. No, but my point is I have a lot of people on my staff who do have children, even though I've tried to talk them out of it. But uh, I'm cautious as I approach a question because I like I, I like to know what sure. I'm talking about before I answer it. But what I will, what I can speak to is certainly we evolved in certain kinds of environments. And the evidence is overwhelming that access to nature is important for optimism is important for a good mood it's in fact by the way it's when you have when you are looking at a wide vista as you get in nature if you're looking at a mountain range peripheral vision uh when we, we when we look out the, uh, the corners of our eyes it calms us down automatically it activates the parasympathetic nervous system and it makes us more creative and uh, for for a number of different reasons, so there's re there is actual real. I don't, I can't speak to children and what we should be doing in schools, right? I don't. I that's just not an area I'm comfortable extending myself in. But like, should everybody be doing this? Children and adults? Yeah, I mean, like you know, all you need to know is a 20 minute walk in the woods outperforms all the SSRIs on the market. That right, plus the fact that it enhances creativity plus the fact that it enhances quality of life, plus the fact that it enhances mood. In my experience, peak performers, any field, doesn't matter what domain you're in, are too busy to solve problems one at a time. You look for multi-tool solutions. You want a solution that will solve six or seven problems at once because you're too busy. Going outside is a huge multi-tool solution. You can, right, you got exercise, benefits there. You've got enhanced creativity, benefits there. You've got enhanced mood, benefit there. You probably uh, are going to enhance innovation. We know novelty, complexity, and unpredictability, which are three things that are built into the natural world. These are all flow triggers. So you're going to get an increased amount of flow and we could like, we can go on and on, right? Like this is, I'm stopping, um, but I could, I could really do this for like the next 10 minutes in terms of the psychological and physiological benefits of being in nature a little bit. And I also say, you know, I think there is, though this is not in the book and I'm not advising anybody to do this, but at a personal level, I like those no longer at the top of the food chain moments that you sometimes have in nature, 
right? Where whether it's <laughs> you know doing something you know access sports wise where you're really playing with primal forces, gravity, things like that, or you know I can't tell you how many times I've been hiking a trail, turned a corner, and there's a bear, or there's a mountain lion, or there's an ocelot, or right, um, depending on which country I'm in, or you know there's a cobra. Like there's something about when you have that that kind of encounter that picks all your day to day problems. Like go back to your argument with your wife, and you know what I mean. Your problem at work after you've bumped into a bear or a cobra, and perspective is something you suddenly have, <laughs> right? Like it's really I find that very very useful, and I think for a lot of people who sort of choose to live their their life in that way, they would agree with me. I don't think this is something normal people want anything to do with it. I'm not, you don't need to do this to perform at your best, but I do think it's a not disclosed, discussed benefit of nature, which is sometimes being in the face of overwhelming power is awesome. It's an amazingly good thing. Now I want to talk about these flow triggers because obviously action sports is one domain. Probably not many in our audience are engaging in action sports. Many people in our audience are struggling a little bit with some social anxiety, frustrated that they can't get in flow with conversations with people in important job interviews or on a great first date. We've all had those moments where we've we've instantly connected with someone, time has disappeared, and all of a sudden you can't believe the conversation ended. How can we create those flow triggers or look for those flow triggers to create that state where we lower our anxiety and we allow ourselves to fully feel it? So there are 22 known flow triggers and the first thing we place we want to start is the simplest flow follows focus it only shows up when all of our attention is in the right here right now so that's what all the triggers do they drive attention into the present moment if i were to put this neurobiologically they do one of three things they either drive norepinephrine into our system which is a neurochemical they drive dopamine into our system another neurochemical or they lower cognitive load among the functions that dopamine and norepinephrine play perform is focus. They massively enhance attention. And so, for example, if I put a little bit of norepinephrine and dopamine into your system, that's the cocktail underneath curiosity. If I crank it up a lot more, that's passion, right? Think about how much attention you pay to anybody you've ever fallen in love with for free. You didn't have to spend any work. You just couldn't stop looking at them, right? That's so... Um, that's what you get from norepinephrine and dopamine and um, cognitive load is all the crap you're trying to think about at any one time. And if I lower cognitive load, I liberate a tremendous amount of energy that can be repurposed for the present moment and attention. So that's what all the triggers do. There are 12 on the individual side that'll get me into flow or you into flow. And then there are 12 or 10 on the group side. And there, there's a lot of overlap between them and you're asking sort of group flow triggers. So first off, credit where credit is due. I did none of the research into group flows triggers. It was all done by a very brilliant psychologist named Keith Sawyer, He's at the University of North Carolina, and he actually did all this work. This is not in Art of Impossible. I think the story's in a different book of mine. He was an improv jazz player. He was studying with Mihai Csikszentmihalyi, the godfather of flow psychology at the University of Chicago. He was a jazz musician. And he started to notice jazz musicians would get into these group flow experiences, and he wanted to study it more. And he teamed up with Second City Television, which is the improv theater troupe, comedy troupe that feeds into Saturday Night Live and a whole bunch of other stuff like that, has for years. And for 15 years, he was their jazz musician. He would like accompany their performances on the piano and film them and did frame by frame analysis. Basically, like he could tell when the performers were in group flow because the level of audience laughter went through the roof, right? Like the performance, came, everybody came together, everybody's laughing. So you can check for that on the like soundtrack and say, okay, what the hell was going on? And he like went frame by frame for 15 years and he came up with these 10 triggers. So this, what you're looking for are those group flow triggers. And you'll notice that a lot of what I'm going to talk about, it's going to sound like stuff you probably had on the show because it's going to sound like stuff that could, would be covered under psychological safety, for example, right? There's a, there's a yeah. tremendous amount of overlap between the group flow triggers, psychological safety. Um, and in fact, I think the psychological safety discussion would be more informed if they understood group flow triggers because there's a couple things in the psychological the safety discussion that you want because it makes people feel safe and secure and is important, but it actually could block good team performance. So 
we haven't yet negotiated some of this stuff. And some of it's like really obvious stuff. When you're building a, a team, right? You want people of equal skill levels, roughly, for the simple reason that, you know, if you're going to play basketball, there's five guys on the team and your point guard's never played before and your power forward is Carl Malone, you've got a problem, right? That's not, Carl's not going to be in flow <laughs> and the, when the poor, right? You know, or for those of you who aren't as old as me, I'm trying to think of a power forward. Um, I just, I, I was reaching into the memory banks. I don't know why. Um, we'll go with LeBron for the, the younger audience. <laughs> I was going for Draymond. That's what I was getting stuck at. I couldn't come up with the, the, the second half of his name. <laughs> I was like, Dre, Dre, Dre. What's his name? Dre. Um, <laughs> We want equal level of skill. You need familiarity, for example. And that means, like, I understand your tics, your tendencies, your language, right? You need common language. Uh, these are really important things. But the most important of group flows triggers is yes and which is the first rule of improv, right? If, yeah. uh, right, if, if you come up to me and you're like, yo, Steven, there's a blue elephant in the bathroom. And I go, shut up. No, there's not. That's not funny. It's not stories going nowhere. But if I say, oh, crap, I hope he's not using up all the toilet paper. I really got to go right now. We can sort of roll into something that's even mildly amusing, um, at least in my head. Uh, <laughs> but uh, my point is, and this doesn't, by the way, mean because if you're familiar with the science of brainstorming, you know that like just loving everybody's idea and going kumbaya is a lousy way that gives you group thing right. it doesn't give you innovation right so yes and is not about like kissing everybody's butt it's about finding something in the, an idea that you can be additive to i can say well you know almost everything you said i'm not really down with but the thing you had about martial amplifiers and fuzzy headed purple dolls i am really into that that that's going to go somewhere right? You, you can do it that way. So, um, and I also, I just want to say this cause I didn't get to say it earlier. There is a lot of analytical flow. It is a misnomer that flow when Ch me high chick set me high, who was the godfather of flow research started doing this work. He was trying to figure out what life, it, why, why life is meaningful. And he was studying people in leisure activities. So he was looking at art and athletics. And so everybody sort of went, oh, this must be for artists or athletes. In fact, uh, this is, he's got a new textbook on flow and education that just came out. And in the opening to the textbook, he says the same thing. He's like, yeah, I sort of made this mistake in the beginning. Um, I was, you know, I was looking at it in this very specific framework. I, there, there's, I work with accountants. We work, you know, we train a thousand people a month at the Flow Research Collective. Ninety percent of them are C-suite executives. That's the vast majority of them. And usually, our specialty is often super overstressed, burned out. You know, I was a peak performer, and then I got super burned out, like, and lost it. Like, we get, we train so many of those people, or our second largest population, and this is just this year, we, you know what I mean? But it changes is uh, powerhouse women in their forties and fifties who took time off to raise a family and are coming back and want, like they did some other job, then they raised their family and they got a taste of, oh, this is what passion feels like. Okay, let's bring that into the workplace. How do I find that? How do I do that? Those are the vast majority of people we work with. And a lot of them have very analytical jobs. And so flow in those environments is really common. It's a really a misnomer that it's just for athletes and for artists. Yeah, and I, I've certainly fallen into that myth myself looking for it in, in my personal life. I think, you know, that brings up another interesting side of this, which I wanted to talk about, you know, obviously everyone understands peak performance and we would, would love to operate at our optimal best. Right now we're, we're living in a time where many of us are feeling burned out and less access to nature, less access to everything that was creating this opportunity for us to find flow. So for those in our audience who are facing burnout and looking to, to jumpstart and get back to where that performance was, and obviously you do this professionally with C-suite executives, what can we do, number one, to identify that it's a state of burnout? Because I think many of us are walking around in a fog, not realizing that it, it could I mean, be burnout. And there are very clear, identifiable symptoms for burnout. I think it's a recognized disorder at this point. 
irritability is really high on the list. When I know I'm burned out, it's always the feeling of, oh my God, I'm going nowhere. Like I'm working really hard and the quality of the work is I can't, like it doesn't matter when I'm burned out, doesn't matter how many times I write a paragraph, it's still shit. I can, like I can rewrite it a hundred times, a hundred different ways and they're all crap. There are precise neurobiological reasons for that. You And there's really good burnout uh, diagnostics online, which is where I would, for free. So I'll send people to there. Let's talk about the second half of the question, which is what the yeah. hell do you do about it, right? And so here, and this is really stuff I cover in Art Impossible under what I call the positive psychology basics. So positive psychology has sort of spent 30 years identifying about six things. Three on the physical side, like this is what you need to do for energy, and three on the mental side. This is what you need to do to sort of like manicure your brain and turn down anxiety and calm the fuck down. They're really not negotiables, but they're not all that arduous, and there's options. So like on the physical side, there's three things that I, that I think sit there. One is, and this is the first thing you could do if you're burned out, is sleep. We human beings need seven to eight hours of sleep a night. You cannot perform at your best without seven to eight hours of sleep at night. There's no way around it. There's no other options. You can't like, there are occasionally people who can function on, on, on less sleep for bits and periods and whatever. But if you're interested in reliable, repeatable, consistent peak performance, and I always tell people a couple things you need to know right off the bat about peak performance. One, peak performance is nothing more than getting your biology to work for you rather than against you. There's right. There's no secret secret. There's nothing. There's just your biology and yeah. it's just getting it to work for you. And then again, not a new idea. A hundred years ago, William James says in the first psychology textbook ever written, he says the great thing then in any education is to get your, to make your nervous system, your ally instead of your enemy, right? This is not new information. There's just our biology and it works a specific certain way and you just, there's no way around this one and we're designed to function with seven, eight hours of sleep a night. You need that to function physically. If you start looking at the list of like, we talk about multi-tool solutions, right? Sleep is, sleep solves so many problems. It's insane mm -hmm. to cut back on that. Second thing on the physical side, we're not going to linger here, but nutrition and hydration eat good food, drink plenty of water, enough said, right? And then the final thing, and this is often, this is often talked about as this positive psychology basic, but the people put it on the cognitive side and there's a mistake there and I'll explain in a minute, which is social support. Chris Peterson, a brilliant uh, positive psychologist at the University of Michigan says, you can sum up 30 years in positive psychology in one phrase, which is other people matter. We are social creatures. We're hardwired. Contact the reasons on the energy side at a like, Everybody's had this experience. You know, you get in a fight with your girlfriend, your boyfriend, your boss, your sister, your mom, and then you try to go to work. How well can you focus? How much energy do you have, right? It's impinging on you physically. What people also don't realize is anytime you encounter a challenge, a problem, anything, your brain does an instantaneous risk assessment. And part of that risk assessment is, do I got posse? Because if you got to solve a problem alone, that's a big problem. Could be. But if you've got six or seven friends, family backing you up, lesser problem. Even if they're not immediately with you and you like you get fired at work, you know somebody's gonna feed you and put a roof over your head. You know, if this podcast thing doesn't work out so well for you guys. <laughs> you know what I mean? Hopefully, so, yeah. Fingers crossed, right? Fingers crossed. Uh what I always tell people, and this is important, is under normal conditions, you can usually screw up one a day, right? Like you can't do it every day. You got to get them right a bunch, but you can screw up one a day and st like still probably perform at your best. You can't get enough sleep, but you've dialed in social support and you've hydrated and you're eating right. You probably can power through and, and do it. Under stress conditions, which is the question you asked, I don't think you can screw up on any of them. Under what we've been dealing with, whether it's the economy, our COVID, the election, I mean, take your pick of, of, of everything that we've gone through over the past year and the turbulence it brought to all of us. I don't think we get to skimp on any one of those. Well, I, I was just going to say, we, we've now been forced in a position where we're trying to escape what's going on. So we're staying up later, watching shows, not really getting the sleep that we need. We're reaching for comfort food and things that maybe aren't as nutritious as we were eating pre-pandemic. And then on top of it, we've removed the social component from our work 
We're on Zoom. We're just quickly having meetings, getting on to the next thing. We're zoned in on our work. We're maybe not seeing family and friends. So it's real easy to see how those three physical things have been drastically impacted by what's going on around us. We're not really realizing it because everyone's going through it at the same time and it's all sort of compounding. Let's shift gears to the other side because that's the the part that I think the other side is important and I and and work we'll come back. We're gonna come back to your idea in half a second after we come to the other side, because the other side is the cognitive side, right? And it's how do we deal with, you know, the ang- anxiety and so much of peak performance, including flow, too much anxiety, which is actually the same neurochemical, norepinephrine, right? If I give you a little bit, you get curiosity. Good. If I give you a little bit more, you get passion. I give you a little bit more, you get anxiety and worry and all, all right. And I give you even more, you, you're into schizophrenia and, and other actual real, like long-term problems. But uh, what do we do to control that? Well, there's three things. A daily gratitude practice. And uh, one, I want to I wanna start with the science because when I say gratitude, I mean nothing wishy-washy. I, we're not talking about new age, spiritual, anything. We, work, uh, at, we do extensive work with Dr. Glenn Fox at USC. He's the world's leading expert on the neurobiology of gratitude. Well, Stephen, before you get into the science, I want to set this up really quick for you because we've, of course, had certainly in our years of podcasting, meditation gurus on the show and, and everyone, there's plenty of people, we even had David Meltzer on a few weeks ago who talked about why gratitude changed his life. So in reading your book and I saw the science, I was like, yes, finally something that we can point to that, that shows. Yeah, it's because otherwise it's ridiculous, much, right? Otherwise right. you're just like, this is freaking nuts. And why, like, yeah, no, I totally agree. Um, and there's, there's two things to know. Like one, affirmations, which is the new age spiritual side, literally are disasters. They don't work. Um, and we'll talk about why. And gratitude works. And the reason, so the thing you have to understand is that one, we have what is known as a negativity bias. We take in more negative information than positive information. Now, we take in 11 million bits of information a second by our senses. That doesn't, this is nothing internal. We also generate a lot of internal stuff, but a guy named Marvin Zimmerman measured it. And according to his measurements, um, it's 11 million bits of information a second. Consciousness, what you're aware of, what you can pay attention to, it's 300 bits of information at once, maybe 2,000 bits at max. People have gone back and forth about what the number is. And to put that in context, you're listening to me talk that's requiring 60 bits of information. If we're both talking at once, you're up to 120. If we add you, we've maxed everybody out. So somewhere between like 120 and 180 is our is our threshold. But nobody, it's very hard to listen to three people talk at once and process the information. You, you usually lose somebody. So that's the threshold. So we take in nine negative bits of information for every one positive bit that gets through. Now, optimism is a huge driver of peak performance. We, it, we perform better when we're optimistic. So that's a problem right then and there. Also, novelty is the foundational ingredient in creativity. And if we're taking in nine negative things, most of this shit that's negative is stuff we've seen before. Right. Very rarely is the stuff that scares us totally out of the blue. My point is that when you do a daily gratitude practice, this tips the ratio and a daily gratitude practice is list three things you're grateful for and turn one of them into a paragraph. It's a five minute practice or list 10 things you're grateful for and just really try to feel the gratitude. And what you do is you tip the brain's negativity bias you start taking in like six to one instead of nine to one or five to one. And this is a huge, huge, huge deal. And the reason gratitude works and affirmations don't work is your brain has a fantastic bolt in bullshit detector. We all know this. You can't lie to yourself. You can lie to almost everybody else, but you cannot lie to yourself for too long. You can't look in the mirror and go, I am a millionaire. I'm a millionaire. I'm a millionaire. If you work at Walmart, your brain goes, dude, shut up. You work at Walmart. And that's massively demotivating, really, really, really demotivating, right? We're going in the exact opposite direction. So gratitude for one works because it tips the negativity bias a little bit in our favor. And um, we also know this is work that we did with Glenn is that a regular gratitude practice actually makes you more prone to flow. 
So it's got a direct correlation with uh, frequency of flow. The next thing is uh, mindfulness, right? You've had guys talking meditation. The thing that I think gets lost is you don't need all that much mindfulness, right? Like if you're really just going for the cognitive benefits and another, again, mindfulness, respiration, really good multi-tool solution, solves a lot of different cognitive issues, emotional regulation, focus, attention, just a lot of good stuff. But 11 minutes a day of breath work is enough to do it, right? And the final thing you can do for your head is exercise, 20 to 40 minutes of exercise. And by the way, what do you get then? You get exercise-induced transient hypofertility, the deactivation of the prefrontal cortex we talked about earlier, right? That's what happens when it gets, you work out in the gym, it gets quiet upstairs about 20, 25 minutes in. That's what's happening. Your prefrontal cortex is deactivating and it's an efficiency exchange. Literally, your brain says, oh, fuck, you need a lot of energy because you're going to need to focus on the treadmill you're running on. <laughs> right. So let's shut off non-critical structures. That's what happens. The point on the cognitive side is five-minute gratitude practice, 11-minute mindfulness practice, or 20 to 40 minutes of exercise. Pick one a day. You don't need to do all three. And in crisis situations, COVID, where we are right now, if you're burned out, et cetera, et cetera, maybe two out of three, right? For the first, in back in March during the lockdown, I was, you know, I was exercising every day. I was meditating every day. I was doing gratitude work every day. And I was doing all six, you know, all the all, uh, sleeping seven, eight hours a night. And they're grit skills in a sense, right? We talk about when we train people in recovery, the art of recovery at the Flow Research Collective, which is crucially important. And by the way, if you're burned out, active recovery is the next thing you have to add in, right? That's the other, right? There, I will, we can talk about the cure for burnout in half a second, but these are the six things to start with. The net, if, if you want, there's two things I'd add if you're burnt out, which is we all have what is known as a primary flow activity. This is whatever that thing you did as a kid that just automatically dropped you into flow. Maybe it was dancing to hip hop. Maybe it was coloring. Maybe it was going to the natural history museum and staring at dinosaur bones. Maybe it was skiing in my case, or, you know what I mean? There's skateboarding in yours, but we all had that activity. And usually as we become adults, it goes away, right? Like, oh, I've got responsibilities. I've got work. This is the thing we hang up with. A couple things to know. One, flow is essentially a focusing skill. So the more flow you get, the more flow you get. I go skiing on Monday. It means that I'm going to have an easier time getting into flow on Thursday because I'm training my brain how to focus in that way. Also, creativity, innovation is massively heightened in flow. 400 to 700%, depending on whose uh, studies you're looking at. And uh, work out of Harvard shows that that heightened creativity will outlast the flow state by a day, maybe two. So even if you go skiing on Monday or skating on Monday, right, that heightened creativity, that heightened problem solving, innovation, all that stuff, it could be with you till Wednesday. This is a huge bonus. And it's an enormous because when we move into flow, um, there's a global release of a chemical, a nitric oxide. It's a gas a signaling molecule. It's everywhere in the body. It completely flushes all the stress hormones out of our system. So it resets the nervous system. If you're burned out, you can't reset your nervous system. That's one of the reasons you're burned out. So automatizes that. And the other thing that I want to add for the burnout crowd is active recovery. Passive recovery is I worked all day, it's a TV and a beer, and that actually blocks what you want. Active recovery, Epsom salt bath, infrared sauna, dry sauna, restorative yoga, a long walk in nature, to go back to the earlier topic, right? Gardening, any of these things, these are sort of restorative, active recovery. Get a massage, foam rollers, take your pick. But we have found at the Flow Research Collective that if you are sort of paying attention to the positive psychology basics. And I don't mean like you're anal. I get it right every single day. I do all, right? I mean, you're just trying to be smart about it. You get regular once a week access to, fl to a flow, even if it's just 20 minutes, a half an hour, an hour, and you have an active recovery protocol. We don't have data on this yet, but as far as we can tell, you can't burn out. Like it seems to be prophylactic against burnout. And That's beautiful. Um, I got to use prophylactic in a sentence. So there. <laughs> <laughs> Especially around burnout, not expecting that. 
I certainly know for myself with COVID, uh, one of the, my activities was my social life of performance, of, of playing music with my band, uh, getting into the rehearsal room. All that was taken from me during COVID. And AJ knows, for me, that was such a large part of my life. I've been playing in bands since I was 15 years old. I love those moments on stage or even, even just getting in the room with the guys and drifting off for in a sound soundscape for a few hours. Having that taken from me has made me during COVID incredibly irritable, not being able to focus. And I've had to set time just to pick up my guitar and and the times of where I would find myself in rehearsals, I would have to find that time again. And it, that has been the most difficult part of COVID for myself, of having that opportunity taken from me. I will say I worked essentially seven years straight to get to a book that was published last January called Futures Faster Than You Think for a lot of different reasons. And I was going to literally I worked seven years straight without even a vacation um, other than going skiing for like half day. You know what I mean? I was going to ski all of March, April and May. I was just done. I was, I've had enough. I was going to, and as soon as Peter and I were like, first day of our book tour was the day COVID hit. So I, they shut the ski resorts. I got no, for seven years, I was aiming for this, just make it here, just make it here. Right. And so I, um, one of the founding ideas underneath resilience is setting long-term is turning current strife into long-term goals. And so what I basically said to myself is the only way I'm going to not go crazy from losing out on the skiing and the, and the access to flow was going to give me was if I could, I, and the goal I set was I, I needed to enter ski season, a better skier than I ended last year. Which and and so I, I was like, well, how do I do that? And I created this crazy training program that I could do without gyms over the summer. Um, and I also, you know, I added a couple more things into it. But I, fa- I, I, this isn't really something we talk about in our impossible. But you're bringing it up. I find that with those kinds of challenges, you can long term goal setting. We don't talk about this a lot. I don't a little bit in our impossible, but because of how we filter information, because it's this huge right. 11 million down to 300. What do we filter? What are, we, what are filters? Well, fear is one, obviously. We talked about that. What's the other half? Goals. That's the other big filter is that our filter on reality is our fears and our goals. We essentially don't live in reality, right? We live in a reality created by our fears and our goals. That's most of the world we're in all the time. And so if you don't have like if you get, are getting your ass kicked in some way, I can't play music with my band, which I, is a high flow thing, really fun, blah, blah, blah. I can see all the problems there. Um, I, like I would say, okay, then I'm going to, you know, I'd set musical challenges and goals that you can accomplish on your own so that when you come back to it, well, after, these, after our vaccines show up, perhaps, it, that, that would be my workaround for that because it was the only way I stayed sane. Nobody was happier to be skiing this week than me. Um, I, I was so happy. I, 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 like, I cannot lift my arm above here because I hit the ground so hard because I was like, just deciding that I was going to, uh, like, I did, I got better. I, I learned a bunch of freestyle tricks over, like, on dirt. Okay. And then I brought them into the, uh, on, onto snow. And let's just say they didn't all go as planned. <laughs> I entered the season stronger and better than I finished last season, but they there were some errors along the way. Which is completely normal. I did hit the ground rather hard about 50 times two days ago. Now, in the, the setup to the book, everyone understands Art of Impossible, the capital I Impossible, the moon shots, and, and you know, the people that are absolutely extraordinary that we look up to. But I, I love this idea of dialing it down to the, the lowercase i and, and bringing it into your own life. We, we've sort of danced around it. We've talked about a few parts of the stack, but I would love as we, we wrap here to really just cover what this impossible stack is and how we can turn that small eye impossible for ourselves with neuroscience into something that we're capable of. So there's two ideas here. One we already talked about, which is peak performance is nothing more than getting your biology to work for you rather than against you. So there's a limited suite of biology, biological tools that I'll get that you can use to take on 
super hard challenges. And, but I want to go to your point. Thank you for bringing this up because um, it's a great point and it's worth making. There, we're all familiar with capital I impossibles, as you pointed. This is Alex Honnold climbing El Cap. This is Rosa Parks sitting at the front of the bus. This is Einstein and the theory of relativity, right? These are the, the White Wright brothers. These are the impossibles. We're familiar with capital I impossible, that which has never been done. There's also a small I impossible, which is that which we believe is impossible for us. And, you know, the simple example I gave was when I was growing up in Cleveland, Ohio, right? blue collar kind of kind of childhood i wanted to be a writer from the time i was four years i didn't know any writers i mean that would be like me waking up one day and being like okay i want to be an elf or a dwarf i think i'd be a dwarf right i mean i had no idea there was no and, and it was impossible in the reason what i mean by that is no clear path between point a and b and statistically horribly bad odds of success but also that's a small eye impossible but so is rising out of poverty or overcoming deep trauma or figuring out how to get paid doing what you love for a living, right? These are all small I impossible. Small I impossible is that which we believe is impossible for us. That formula is nobody, very few people set out to accomplish capital I impossible. That's not what they set out to accomplish. They set out to accomplish small I impossible and they do the first one and they're like, oh, wow. I pulled myself out of poverty or I, I lost a leg or I was raped or whatever it was that was horrifying. I go, what else can I do? What can I do next? What can I do next? What can I do next? And if you accomplish enough small I impossibles, sooner or later, you will start pushing into capital I impossible range, right? right? It's what happens. The actual formula is actually fairly simple. It's when you're talking about human peak performance, you need the motivation to get you into the game. And motivation is a catch-all, right? It, when psychologists talk about motivation, they're talking about intrinsic motivation, curiosity, passion, purpose, right? They're also talking about goals and grit. And in a sense, you need the motivation to get into the game. Goals tell you where you're going. Grit is, keeps you going. Then you need learning, right? Because learning allows you to continue to play. And then you need creativity because that's how you steer. Right. That's how you get where you want to go. That's the self-expression we talked about earlier. And finally, you need flow to turbo boost everything beyond all reasonable expectation. And that's literally that's the the system is designed to work that way, literally in that order. Right. Like the system is designed to start with really basic intrinsic motivators. Curiosity. Curiosity is designed to be built into passion. Passion is designed to be built into purpose. Once you have purpose, what do you need? Autonomy, another big intrinsic motivator, the freedom to pursue your purpose. Once you're free to pursue your purpose, what do you need now? Mastery, the skills to pursue that purpose. Well, okay, I've got the skills, I've got the freedom, what do I need now? I need goals, where the fuck am I going, right? Like, it's, it's not, it's very commonsensical and the neurobiology follows the common sense in a sense, in, in a, that was an awkward sentence, but you get my point. <laughs> well, and I want to start at the the beginning because we have uh, a certainly clients over the years who who come to us feeling a lack of curiosity, and it then becomes difficult, obviously, to get on this journey of impossible without that starting point. And and in the book, you had a great challenge that I would love to share with our audience around building up this curiosity. I'm gonna make it easier for your audience. We're gonna send your audience to passionrecipe.com, and the whole full print thing you're gonna put people through. Beautiful. We. Put it up. We built it. A good friend of ours built the coolest interactive PDF for the whole thing. So it like we got sexy tech underneath the passion recipe now. It's even better than it is in the book. But yeah, this is how you cultivate curiosity. This is how you turn curiosity into passion. This is how you turn passion into purpose. And certainly this is one of those dividing lines for a lot of people, right? Some people, your music, my skiing and writing, like I've known what I wanted to do since I was four and the puzzle was how to yeah, do it. There was, right? Right. There was no question. It, right. Other people are like, oh my God. And, but a couple things to say here, I say this in the book, but it's, you always have to remember passion on the front end when you're starting, it never looks like passion on the back end, right? I say, what does a passionate athlete look like? And you're, you got LeBron James, it's the windmill scowl dunk um, in the finals, right? Over some poor, 
<laughs> some poor point guard's head. We was like with that skull on his face that he gets. Like we, that's what we think of as passion, right? And we forget that on the front end, passion is just like a little kid in a in a driveway shooting a ball through a hoop, right? That's what it looks like on the front end, and it looks like that for all of us. And curiosity and the passion, like it's a learning process, and. As a learning process, the rule is the same. You're going to suck until you don't, right? Like learning is an invisible process. So our experience is I suck, I suck, I suck, I suck. Oh, wow, I don't suck, right? That's not, And that's everybody in the world, right? Like there's my, my friend, uh, Andrew Uberman, who's a neuroscientist at, at Stanford. He says the thing that peak performers always know that most people don't know is it's always crawl, walk, run. Most everybody else comes in going, I want a shortcut. I, I don't want to, I'm not going to crawl. And I'm really not all that interested in walking. Can I, can I jog? I'm going to start out. I'm going to find some way. I'm going to get jiggy. I'm going to start to jog. Right. And peak performers know that it's always like all of us. It doesn't matter who you are. You could be best in the world at whatever. When you switch to something new, whatever it is, it could be turning your ass into passion. It's always crawl, walk, run. And so peak performers just don't waste any time. Like, it's not that they're even, they're going to get there faster. It's not that they're faster than you. It's that you're fucking around trying to look for a shortcut. <laughs> right. And peak performers are just like, yeah, That's there, the way are, of there are no yeah, shortcuts. Exactly. This is how you learn this the hard way, which uh, I think well, is incredibly useful when you approach these ideas. You were saying something. Well, I just want to add to that. And finding other people who are at your level at skill set to build community to be able to do it together. Because as you said, you can't lone wolf this stuff. Well, you can, but it's it's damn hard. It's very difficult. But if you have others around you who are just excited about this new thing that you all suck at, you can all go out there and suck at it together and have a blast. And for uh, for ourselves with our community is pairing up everyone to work on these things that they're they're all walking into for the first time and having fun with it and anything that you can surround yourself with other people at that level who are passionate about it or is at least curious you you will turn it in the fun I agree. And, I, and by the way, I'm an introvert lone wolf. Like I, that's how I'm <laughs> wired. Like I really am. I, I'm, my wife is too. Like both of us will spend 14, 15 hours a day by ourselves, not talking to anybody. And I'll go down a writing hole and I won't talk to, I won't even talk to her much for months on end. Like, but I will say it's right with flow science and researchers. Like, like it is more fun. Um, and I'm the biggest lone wolf and I love that shit, but it is more fun if you can do it together. Well, we love this line. Both of us frustration. Isn't the sign you're moving in the wrong direction. It's the sign you're moving in the right direction. And oh, that hit this me. dovetails brilliantly. That's a cognitive load issue, right? Like flow is the best we get to feel on the planet, but there's a struggle phase. It starts with struggle. And so this is not in the book. Maybe this is a line, but this is work we're doing right now. It appears that you will always need to at least trigger the fight response to get into flow. So even yeah. if it only lasts a second, right? Like you're going to have to get gritty and aggressive for just a nanosecond um, on the front end of flow. So you're not going to ever avoid the struggle. And yeah, I think this is an education comment, right? This is something I do tell parents, which is like, you have to teach this to your kids. Because when I was growing up, I thought when I got frustrated, I couldn't learn something. And I was, I was doing something wrong. Exactly. I, like, I was like, oh, it, it's a sign you're going in the right direction. This was also, this is another story in the book that I thought for a really long time until Laird Hamilton set me straight. I thought courage meant not feeling fear. I didn't realize that exactly. courage meant, oh, you, you, everybody feels this terrible. You just do it anyways. I thought to be courageous, I had to not feel fear. And I was like, I don't know how to do that. I'm scared of everything. But I can learn to ignore the fear and go right at it if that's, you know what I mean? Yeah, staring down the fear. And I, I think that's such an important lesson because there are so many things in life that frustrate us and we drop them. And we don't even get to the state that we could get curious to start the path to flow. We feel frustration and we back away. 
And we say that's for someone else. And we never really push through that. And to realize that that's a signal that we're on the right track, not going in the wrong direction. Exactly. It's even better than that. Like not only is it a signal you're on the right track, there's overwhelming evidence. And uh, Dave, David Epstein, who I write about David's work in Art Impossible, he's a friend. He talks about this a lot more in range. But the science is really clear. You cannot predict what you're going to be good at or what you're going to like before doing it and actually before getting good at it, right? Like literally this is, you can take a perfect, you can go to LeBron James and say, okay, you are obviously a professional athlete. You know, your body super well. Let's say LeBron's never played high line, right? Or badminton. And you, you can say, LeBron, do you think you're going to like high line or badminton or lacrosse? If he's not played those sports, even with his level of physical prowess, he's not an accurate judge of whether or not he's going to like it or be good at it, which is crazy, but it seems to be true. So you can't like your frustration is a sign you're moving in the right direction. And honest to God, until you get past the frustration, you have no idea if you're going to like it or be good at it. For me, that's golf. And I, when I think about professional athletes as they retire, trying to take up golf and seeing just how frustrated Charles Barkley was over the weekend, we, <laughs> we look at athletes and we, we assume that things just come naturally to them, that frustration was not a part of that journey at all. And I, I love that you point that out. Yeah, you know, Laird Hamilton and I talk about something else that's very similar along those lines, which is, he's, he has said this to me, he's like, you know, people see me on a 50-foot wave or a 100-foot wave and they think, oh, I could never freaking do that. Like, that's impossible. I could never do that. He's like, what they didn't see is, three-year-old me on a three-foot wave and four-year-old me on a four-foot wave and five-year-old me on a five-foot wave, right? Like people look at that and go, oh my God, that's crazy. That's impossible. And, and for him, a week ago, he surfed a 49 and a half foot wave. So what he's doing today is like, it's a half a foot harder for him, but you're the, everything else is completely invisible to you. And so you don't see that and you, right, you miss all of that stuff. I, well, now we have the technology in the videos for all of these athletes. I've, I always think about Tony Hawk. We basically have watched his career from 13 years old, which is just remarkable. Now, we love to ask every guest what their X factor is, what sets them apart, skill set and mindset to make them successful. Obviously, locking yourself up for seven years to write a book, you know a few things about your own X factor. How would you define your X factor? People will tell you I'm willing to outwork anybody. I just always assume that I wasn't the smartest guy or the most talented guy, but I don't get into anything if I can't try to be best in the world. If I'm going to do it, I want to be best in the world. I want to try to be best in the world. Otherwise, I don't get involved. So they'll say that I, if you actually ask me, I think what I, the, my X factor is everything I've done has, I, it's because I think macroscopically very well. I, so I, I can think very, very, very broadly and saw when I was a journalist, I was what was known as a big think writer, which sounds fancy, but it means I worked at the intersection of subjects, right? There's so a, you want to like crawl down a money trail. I'm not your guy. That's a different kind of thing. But like, if you want to know where does politics and religion and action sports intersect and go find a story there, I'm your guy. And it's because I think naturally at a systems level. So thinking microscopically was very difficult for me. I have to know the big picture framework before I can understand it. And I don't know if that's an actual skill or the fact that I was interested in things like systems analysis and evolution and how rainforests work and those kinds of questions that force you to, to learn to think that way. So I don't know which, if it was natural or came first, that and the fact that I love to read. I mean, you know what I mean? Like books yeah. are where they keep the secrets folks, right? I, I love that saying. It's so and right. we would love our audience to read your latest, The Art of Impossible. Thank you so much for joining us. This is such a pleasure. Oh, it was my pleasure. Thank you guys. Appreciate you.